Good evening, and thanks to all of you for joining us today for a conversation with Timothy Snyder, Nora Krug, and Adam Gottnick. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, now in our 26th season. I'm so grateful that Tim and Adam are returning to Writer's Block, and we welcome Nora. If you took a deep sigh of relief when Joe Biden became president, thinking that the nightmare of the previous four years were in, was in our rearview mirror, you did that way too soon. Recent events prove that Timothy Snyder's manifesto on tyranny is clearly as urgent now as it was in 2017 when his first edition emerged. We need to be able to distinguish fact from fiction and to recognize dangerous symbols and dog whistles for what they are. In this new and editorially expanded edition of On Tyranny, award-winning artist and author Nora Krug reconstructs On Tyranny into an editorially expanded visual prism of history, social activism, and dire warning. What a program. Tim Snyder is the master of resistance politics in America and in Central Europe. And through Nora Krug, we can visualize his mandates for the future. Nora Krug, by the way, is a professor at Parsons School of Design, was named Illustrator of the Year at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London a few years ago, and won the National Book Critics Circle Book, yeah, Book Critics Circle Award in autobiography for her book, Belonging, A German Reckons with History and Home. Timothy Snyder holds a chair in history at Yale and is an expert on 20th century Central Europe and the Holocaust. And I recommend his other great books to you on those subjects. You'll have questions. Email them to us at reservations at writersblockpresents.com and visit our website, writersblockpresents.com, to find a link to Skylight Books to get this book with signed book plates. It's a must if you're at all interested in our current moment in America. Adam Gopnik is an author and playwright and a regular columnist for The New Yorker. He writes on arts, politics, culture, and everything in between. I love how his columns lead me down one road and somehow turn into something much greater, much more profound than when I blithely anticipated. His book, A Thousand Small Sanities, A Defense of Liberalism, might be read side by side with On Tyranny. His book, From Paris to the Moon, is one of my favorite meditations about Paris. Email your questions to reservations at writersblockpresents.com. Thank you. I'm so delighted to present Timothy Snyder, Nora Krug, and Adam Gottnick. Good evening, um, Timothy, Nora. It's a huge uh, pleasure and honor for me to have a chance to meet you, if only in this in this strange remote way that's become our norm in the past two years, but perhaps is sliding out of favor now. Um, uh, this book uh, on tyranny, uh, the graphic edition, is an extraordinary work. It takes uh, Timothy Snyder's uh, uh, inspiring and uh, in many ways uh, frightening text, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> gives it a whole new dim visual dimension. And I have to say, when I first heard about it, I was frankly puzzled. I didn't know what imagery could bring to a text already so nail sharp in its, uh, in its attack. And yet uh, I was um, startled and delighted to find that the imagery in does give it a whole other dimension of urgency and meaning. I, I want to celebrate and converse about the book tonight, but I don't want to leave aside the subject matter of the book. And I want to provoke as much as I can a conversation about the emergency we're in. But before we do that, I'd love to talk a little bit about the genesis of the book. Um, Nora, if I may. Um, could you tell us something about what got you interested in doing a, a graphic version of, of Tim Snyder's book and how you came to approach what I would have thought was a, a hugely challenging question of what could be added to it and how you would uh, augment it? Sorry, I tried to unmute myself. Uh, thanks so much for, for having me and us all here. Thanks to everybody who's watching. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so the, uh, the story behind the book was um, I, um, I had written and illustrated another book before the book Belonging and uh, Timothy Snyder had read the book um, because I had reached out to him to see if he uh, would be willing and able to write a, a short comment for the back of the book. And he graciously agreed, and that's how he became familiar with my work. And then he reached out to me 
a little bit later um, to ask me if I might be interested in illustrating this uh, this book of his. And I had always um, admired him as a historian and also as a public intellectual talking about, you know, the most important um, moments of uh, that we're living through. And um, I was very excited to be asked. And um, of course, a little intimidated by the text at first. Um, one challenge I had was that uh, other than the previous work I've done, um, it was not, you know, a, a narrative. It was, it is, a, as you all know, a set of questions, a set of um, guidelines. Um, and um, so I had to find a different way of approaching it uh, from a conceptual and an artistic point of view. And I, I decided to work myself um, chapter by chapter through the book because I wanted to see how um, the reader would perceive the illustrations as they made their way through the book, basically. Not, not to interrupt you, Nora, and I know you're going to show, share with us some of the imagery, but one of the things that struck me, and I wonder if I could ask you this, was how much the, the graphic style and the illustrations reference some of the great uh, political, graphic political styles, particularly of Germany, of the teens and 20s and 30s, uh, of, uh, of Dada and the Bauhaus, someone like Hannah Hawke and so on. Yes, I'm very influenced by German Expressionism, Otto Dix, George Gross, mm -hmm. um, and partly because their work is political and it's also very, you know, pacifist, basically, which is a, a view that I obviously share. Um, and you mentioned Hannah Höck, uh, this idea of a collage-like character, maybe we can take a look at the first image, um, uh, was very important to me as well. I really looked at the book as a, as a collage of um, my own drawings, uh, old prints, uh, postcards that I found at flea markets and, and antique shops, and historic photographs that I combined um, in the book. Um, can we maybe see the first image? Or are we already seeing it and I'm just not seeing it? Oh, okay. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. Um, so there's an example from the beginning uh, part of the book. Um, and the reason for why I mix these different mediums is because I wanted to show that tyranny is um, both timeless and universal. Um, I wanted to contextualize my contemporary illustrations with older images um, to make a connection because I think that's essentially what Timothy Snyder does in his book is he's telling us why um, it is so relevant to look at the past and um, that we don't exist in a historic vacuum, um, that we are made of the past and that we have to continue to, um, to confront it. Um, I don't know if I should say anything else about some of the images or... Maybe well, you, I do know that, talk to us if you would a little bit, Nora, about the use of um, photographs. So many of them are, are found photographs uh, that might be unfamiliar, um, kind of part of the, uh, as you were saying, uh, you know, in the classic uh, uh, expressionist way, part of the detritus of, uh, of uh, the 20th century. Yeah, so the image you saw on the right in the previous uh, example uh, that showed the two men, thank you, um, there are two unidentified escaped slaves um, that were photographed by McPherson and Oliver between 1861 and 1865 in Louisiana. Uh, and I found this at the Library of Congress. And of course, the Library of Congress is full of important uh, images and photographs that, you know, sometimes just they exist in archives and nobody gets to see them or you, you only see them in certain contexts and I wanted to highlight the importance of some of those images and I chose this image in particular because um, it was important to me to have these two figures um, looking at the at the reader um, and in doing so first of all we become witnesses of their fate of their you know the situation they found themselves in but they're also now looking at us. Um, you know, they, they looked at the camera back then and now they're looking at us. And it's, it's, I see it a little bit as a call of action. They're looking at us as if to say, you know, as if to remind us that there's a clear direct connection between slavery and contemporary racism and that we have to, uh, that we have a responsibility. Um, and in the next example, um, equally I chose, um, figures on both sides that look at the readers. So on the left page, you see 
two Austrian men in, uh, in uniform who set, put up a sign on the um, storefront, on a, on a Jewish storefront, saying a no penny to the Jews, meaning, you know, let's boycott Jewish shops. Um, and one of the men is looking at us as if to invite us to join him in this boycott. And then on the opposite page where Timothy Snyder talks about the disappearance of Jewish life, um, you know, during that time, I portrayed a, a Jewish woman who also looks at the reader and who is about to disappear. And again, she's, she's facing us as if to ask, you know, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to keep, you know, keep the memory alive, or what? What are you doing now to prevent, uh, uh, you know, ha that happening again? Uh, and you basically have the choice. You know, you, you look at these both, both both images, and you have you have the choice, and you're confronted with asking yourself this moral question. Next one. Next one. Oh, there we are. Uh, um. Yeah, this is just an example for two, um, two illustrated pages that, that I illustrated. And what was important to me also was that I approached the text. The text is so clear um, and it's also um, really humane um, and it, because it talks about our basic responsibility as, um, as civil you know, human beings, as, uh, as citizens. Um, and uh, it was so important to me not to translate the text one by one into images, but to find a, a po poetic level that would um, hopefully draw the reader in on an emo um, emotional level and add another, um, another dimension in a way to the text. As with this image of the collective trance uh, into which um, mass spectacle can make us fall. Yeah. Shall we look at the next one? Next one. Uh, this was for, uh, I believe, the chapter Believe in Truth. Sorry, Timothy, can you? Yeah, that's right. You're okay. right. Yeah. Um, and as much as about this chapter is about truth, it's of course also about lies and lying and our uh, readiness to lie. Uh, and so I had a lot of fun with this chapter because it's, you know, a lot of it talks about conspiracy theories. And um, the page on the right talks about the uh, kind of poisonous uh, idea of, um, you know, if you repeat the same lie over and over again, people will believe that it's true. And so right. it shows the tr transformation from, um, from a woman into a monster. Of, of, of not literally Hillary Clinton, but of someone who's not a million miles away from Hillary Clinton. It's a wonderful piece too of that great uh, satirist trick of metamorphosis. I thought of um, Philippon's fav famous pair as I was looking at this, where the king, uh, where King Louis becomes more and more and more apparent here, someone like Hillary Clinton is transformed by um, uh, by language into a in exactly into a monster. Shall we look at the next one? Um, yeah. So this is again about lying and then about our readiness to to lie and also to uh, enjoy exaggerations as part of a narrative tool you know, as spectators. And this was true, obviously, during the time of the Trump regime, um, where he told more than 27 lies a day, as Timothy states in the book. And uh, we almost enjoyed listening to that. It became a spectacle and we didn't critically question our readiness to enjoy it. And um, I started collecting postcards that are referred to as tall tale postcards. They're from around 1910. And they're photo montages um, from that time where um, artists work with exaggeration and, and lies, basically visual lies, but in, in a humorous way. But I wanted to show by using them in the book, I wanted to show that, um, you know, this willingness to enjoy exaggeration and believe in lies. Um, is not new. Um, and the right page talks about um, the self deifying um, quality that some, you know, some leaders uh, portray. And I wanted to just uh, show this hand that's that's lying, you know, that, um, and that uh, claims to be this um, powerful voice that um, that carries the truth, basically. And the, the photograph in the background is actually taken from and uh, an album of, of, of photographs that I found, photographs 
uh, of uh, by a German World War II soldier. I found this album at a flea market in Berlin because I've been collecting objects and photographs um, from that time because I wanted to get a more tangible sense of what um, what life under the Nazi regime felt like at the time. And so this is a photograph that he took probably uh, on the Western Front where he was stationed at the beginning of the war. And I, I just use that as the backdrop for my drawing. Amazing. I, I can't help but think, you know, Marx's famous line, first time tragedy, second time farce about Louis Napoleon again. But it's also the case that uh, these things you're using, uh, things that were it's kind of first time uh, comedies, uh, first time far, second time tragedy. All of this imagery that was meant to be comic and absurd in the first instance now hits us with a special kind of urgency when we see the pernicious possibilities of those tropes of exaggeration and distortion and so on. It's a wonderful, and, and it keeps the book from ever feeling uh, heavy at all. It's uh, uh, an odd word to use about a book so frightening. So it's a delightful book uh, to, uh, to turn through and, and walk through. Um, I, as I said, you know, I can't recommend the book too highly for its, its, its charm, but I don't want us to miss the opportunity to talk, and I'm sure it's what um, so many of the people who have tuned into us tonight have on their mind, to talk about where we are tonight in the ongoing story of this wave, this new wave of um, neo-totalitarianism, authoritarianism, populism. I love the fact, Timothy, that you just chose the word tyranny to describe this this phenomenon and make it plain in the in the book that you're talking both about the um, totalitarianism of the left, the authoritarianism of the right, and um, and all of the all of the places. I'm just back from France, uh, where we're seeing the rise, very alarming, of a new kind of authoritarian nationalism in the mouth and hands of Eric Zemmour, uh, a interestingly anti-Trump-like figure who is also uh, a Trump-like figure. And I wonder, Tim, if I can ask you, first of all, let me say what a pleasure it is to be sharing a space with you. I have read your work for years and years. I have always been uh, um, uh, amazed by it and have sometimes argued with it. I've devoted thousands of words in the pages of The New Yorker uh, to what you have to tell us because it is of such uh, importance about the Holocaust and about our own time. So uh, I'm honored to be on stage with you tonight. But I wonder, you talk very much in, in On Tyranny about the role of um, the, the professionals, the role of the police, the role of doctors, the role of lawyers in enabling uh, uh, tyranny and enabling totalitarianism. One of the things that I've been most struck by, and I'd love to hear you talk about, is the role of intellectuals in, in enabling tyranny, of people who are supposedly people of the mind. Coming back from France, it, it, it hits with particular force because, of course, one of the truths about the Vichy regime of the 1940s is exactly that so many uh, French intellectuals of the right who we would have thought might know better looked at that moment and thought that they decided that their hatred of their historic enemies on the left, the socialists, the Bolsheviks, the Jews, was so much stronger even than their historic hatred of the Germans that they sided with the collaborationist state uh, against um, uh, against the resistance. Uh, and I have to say that I am every day, um, I, perhaps I shouldn't be shocked, but I am frightened to see the degree to which once um, respectable conservative intellectuals have made their peace with Trump and with Trumpism, and rather than receding as a wave of, for lack of a better word, of collaboration, it seems only to be augmenting every day. I wonder if you if you have the same perception and uh, and what you think of the responsibility of intellectuals, historians, philosophers at this moment. Okay. Um, I mean, before before I launch into that, I just want to I just want to reciprocate. I mean, it's it's been wonderful reading you for for you know for decades now and learning and learning from you. Um, I'd forgotten about the thousands of words about me. I'm really like very good at forgetting what other people write about me or just not reading it. But in this case, forgetting. But I remember that when you reviewed On Tyranny, you made a very sharp point about, um, about the, difficult, the inherent difficulty of having a, a political party which is spiraling away from democratic practice and like where that actually leads you. And you put that very pithily and captured the argument better than I had in the book. I'm really glad to be able to talk to you. And I'm really glad to be able to talk to Nora um, I mean, the nice thing about our collaboration is that 
I did my thing and she did her thing. And so now, now this is all fresh to me too, just like it is to the rest of the audience. And I, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy being, being together with Nora and talking about the book together. Um, I, I, I want to answer your question first at a, at a kind of reflective level. Artists are also here very much part of the traison de clair, right? I mean, artists who become propagandists, um, filmmakers who become propagandists, graphic artists who become propagandists, painters who become propagandists. And I mean, I'll, I'd be interested to see what Nora, what Nora says about this, but there's something about her approach in both of her books or the two books of hers that I know, where which seems to be very self-consciously collected, um, very self-consciously aware of um, the, 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 the way that art has to be, the, the way that art has to contain itself, like to make your point in a, in a careful way, right? In a, in a careful way, a way where like the, the boundaries are kind of marked off. And um, so for example, in, in her rendition of my book, the obvious thing to do would have been to put lots of propaganda in it. And she doesn't do that at all, right? There are these like, there are these images, images that we just looked at where there's several ways that they, they help you to think about propaganda, but they're not, they're not propaganda. There's no irony either, right? And historians, oh, historians are also traitors. Historians have historically been traitors in the sense of betraying, you know, the, the universal mission of, of intellectuals to be critical or to, or to hold up certain values that are universal. Um, historians are also regularly traitors in that sense. And I had that in mind when I wrote on tyranny, right? I thought, okay, as a historian of Eastern Europe, what is the small thing that I can do? And this then you know, gets closer to the, 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 the broad version of your question about, about intellectuals now. I mean, when I look at the 20th century, I can see you know two versions of the mistake or the error you're describing. One version is the nihilist version where you say, yes, as you say, I, the, I despise this so much, I hate this so much. Right, I'm willing, you know, as as a lot of brilliant French intellectuals did, I'm willing to let I'm willing to let France go in the service of something else, and then there's then there's the other mistake, which is to believe too much, right? Um, to not to love too little, to love too much, and that's the Stalinist mistake or the Leninist mistake of like of 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 believing in one idea, which then organizes and subordinates all other ideas and all and all other all other values. And in our own way, we see that now. I agree with you. Like, if if when I when I think of 2016, you know, when, when I was canvassing, I went door to door and I listened to a lot of other people had to say. I was struck by just this. I was struck by how many Americans didn't mind if Russia was present in our election, right? Because Hillary was worse. That was the thinking. Like, we don't mind if Russia. Like, we don't mind if we're not really sovereign. We don't mind if our election is corrupt. So long as it's not the Democrat. So long as it's not Hillary, right? Sovereignty, patriotism. It's all. It's all it's all out the window, you know. That kind of that kind of nihilism about yourself is very much present, and it, like so in the book, I'm trying to find it's not a middle ground. Like that can't be. There's never there can't be a middle ground between believing too much and believing too little. It has to be some other way. And I mean, what I'm after is you know the small t, the small H history, and the small T truth. Um, you know, these are from from both uh, you know, the from the Klemperers and and then also from the anti-communist dissidents. Those are the kinds of lessons I'm trying to draw, but well, not just draw them out explicitly, although I do a little bit of that, but follow them, like to like to exemplify them, to try to be an intellectual in politics without going, you know, without, because the easiest thing to do is give up the mission and say like, okay, like we're irrelevant, nobody cares about the humanities anymore, you know, just laugh at everything, give up, right? That's the easy thing to do. And I'm trying not to do that. I'm trying to say, look, we actually, we can't, there are these things that we can do, which seem humble, but maybe they're significant. Yes, absolutely. Nora, did I wanted to ask you about that as well? If you can, if one of the things that's striking, of course, and you draw so beautifully on uh, German traditions, one of the things that's striking is that um, the degree to which, in some respects, certainly in architecture, um, the Nazis had uh, had significant power, had significant ways of seducing uh, artists who we might think in architecture and movies, particularly. Uh, to use the incredible uh, persuasive powers of those forms for their own ends. Yes, I mean, you could obviously see it in Albert Speer's brutalist architecture. You could also see it in the films of Leni Riefenstahl exactly right. <clears throat> and in the art that was promoted as, you know, the, the real art at the time and then the degenerate art shows uh, that portrayed the opposite. So um, as Timothy pointed out, I think uh, 
visual, the visual and, and you know, il illustrators and artists have played a huge role in, in this political process as well. And that's why we have such a strong responsibility to use this medium carefully. And um, uh, that's, that's also, I mean, to get back to Timothy's question, uh, also the reason for why I decided not to use any propagandistic images um, with the exception of one case where I draw something in a, in a semi-propagandistic way, um, basically a depiction of Vladimir, Vladimir Putin, Putin sitting shirtless on a horse um, that I try to make look like a uh, yeah, an old, um, basically old communist porcelain uh, sculpture. Um, but I, I did that in a way to criticize uh, propaganda imagery. Um, so there was like a meta level to that. But I, I'm very much aware of the historic responsibility we have mm -hmm. as illustrators. I mean, illustration has often been abused throughout history, even from the beginning of its time. It was abused for, you know, to, to convey anti Semitic ideas, for instance, in, in early prints. and chiseled in, in stone walls and Semitic images in the Middle Ages. So um, yeah, obviously in, in, in every profession, we have to ask ourselves um, what, what's our responsibility here and in what way do we play a part? One of the things that I love about the, the graphic version of On Tyranny 2 is it has a wonderfully handmade and artisanal uh, feel and it's reflected in the typography, which is not typography or not conventional typography, but gives us the appearance of something handwritten. Um, and I thought that was particularly appealing exactly because one of the points of the text that was most uh, uh, provocative and uh, surprising in some ways when it, when it first came out uh, was you know, the emphasis, um, Tim, that you put on the immediate near at hand uh, personal, the one of the strongest ways that we can fight against the encroachments of tyranny is by unplugging, by turning to our neighbor, by creating small institutions, things that are tangible and tactile and returning to the tangible and tactile world and away from the world of, of spectacle and screens that seduces so many of us. And the book and that and the, your um, uh, visual version of it, Nora, reflects that set of values so, um, so beautifully and so uh, persuasively in itself. But I, I wonder if you, if Tim, if you talk a little bit about that, because I think it's one of the surprising things for many people who read this book. They expect to be told about the danger of lies and the responsibilities of the professions. But one of the things you emphasize is make eye contact and small talk, uh, that that's one of the powerful weapons in our arsenal against the encroachments of the totalitarian state. And I have to imagine that it was inspired by your work in Eastern Europe, where that idea of building up uh, resistance yeah. through the creation of small communities turned out to be so powerful. Yeah, it, it comes it comes from there. I just I want to say one thing in this connection about Nora's art and the internet. So the this version of the book takes a lot longer to read than the other one mm -hmm. because the images the images concentrate you. Th then your ver then the then, then, then yeah then the word, original word text. version alone right. Yeah, because the the images the, whether I mean they whether you are thinking they're going to do this or not, they draw you, they draw, they draw you in, they slow you down. And the way images on the internet generally work is by flickering or by some, some kind of, you know, there's an, there's an adjacent, adjacent phenomenon or, or, or there's a flickering, you know, or there's some kind of quick narrative or there's some kind of alternation. And, and that works on your brain one way. And these work on your brain in a completely different way. They slow you down and they concentrate you and they make the act of reading itself much more, much more physical. I find, and I see with children, like the, the people, I've seen a couple of children read these book, read the book now, and it's been interesting to see like how they, they hold it very carefully and kind of get literally like drawn into it, like physically drawn into it, which I find, which I find beautiful. Yeah, but, so yeah, a picture book is inherently a prize book. A picture book is a present. Uh, it's not <laughs> a, it, it's not just a, a something we find in the mail. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like what, I mean, Nora's already heard this anecdote before, but in one case, the kid said, Hey, this is not a comic book, and then kept reading, <laughs> right? And I just, I just love that because it's not, you know, it's not. It's um, it's 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 Nora's adding several media to the medium that was already there. But you're right, the corporeal politics of the the phrase corporeal politics. 
I, I took from Ukraine in 2014, the Ukrainian protests of 2013, 2014. One of my friends there, um, one of my one of my one of my left wing friends, used the phrase corporeal politics, which I liked very much. Of course, it, there's other places you can get that. Judith Butler talks about it, but he meant you know the, just the physical presence, right? Like you're not sure what you can do, but you have to be there, and that there's a difference between being there and watching it on TV. And then something several of my friends back then said about the Maidan in Ukraine and those protests was, I was more afraid when I was watching TV mm -hmm. than when I was there. Mm -hmm. Even though of course, objectively, the danger is greater when you're there. And that for me was a kind of revelation, right? Like, yeah, you probably, sometimes we have to take risks, um, but wouldn't it, like if we're gonna be afraid, how about we'd be afraid when we're actually taking risks? as opposed to being more afraid and taking fewer risks. That seems wrong, right? That seems that seems authoritarian. I got it, so that phrase I got from there, but then the you're absolutely right about late communism, the dissidents. So in the discussions of the book, it's very easy to go to the fascists and the Stalinists, and I'm happy to go there too, but actually the most important influence is probably late communism because late communism is a kind of failed consumerism. Late communism is a time when social mobility is slowed down. Late communism is a time of propaganda, big lies that no one really believes in, right? And so that period and the dissidents who wrote in it, um, people that you know you know well, like Adam Michnik and Václav Havel, they're very important to me. They're very important to this book in particular. And, 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 and Havel's, um, you know, Havel's Power of the Powerless, which Nora illustrates beautifully on a whole page and on a page where, um, with the effect of, of, of doing the right thing in a small scale with language is positively compared to an earlier page, which depicts concentration camps. It's an extraordinary juxtaposition, which I just find overwhelmingly um, effective. Um, so that's one source of it. But then another source of it is familiar from another period, which is the, the moment in the memoir, which you come across in both Stalinism in like 36, 37, 38, and in National Socialism in usually actually around the same period, starts a little bit earlier, the moment when the, the memoirist, the survivor says, my neighbor stopped reading me. People started walking across the street. People stopped making eye contact. So it also comes from there, right? Like if, if we can avoid that impulse to cross the street, if we can keep making eye contact with people who were being instructed, maybe we should be shying away from, then we might stop something in its tracks. Y yes, you know, my, my, my son, uh, reported worked on a, a political campaign in Staten Island uh, in the 2018 can, uh, election. And he talked about the transformative effect on his life of going up on porches and knocking on the doors of people who had service stars in the windows and two American flags on the, on the front porch and how that was the most instructive political act he'd ever engaged in, finding a language of commonality, finding a way to make you not have be thrown out, uh, mm -hmm. but to to talk in common, and that that was the most that was far more powerful than uh, any any anything that could that could happen on on Twitter. Um, uh, it seems to me at the same time, you know, when we talk about those um, that kind of uh, uh, that community building, that it's one of the reasons why the Women's March was so effective right after uh, Trump's inauguration. Uh, even if it didn't have highly specific politics, we're going to do this, exactly the phenomenon you're talking about, Tim, that is people saying, oh, I'm much less frightened when I'm with other people who and recognize uh, mm -hmm. that there's a community who shares my views and shares my fears and shares and and shares my and shares my values. Um, one of the other things, though, that comes up is that beautiful story of, uh, I guess it's the Vaclav Havels, about the, um, the butcher and the and the sign. That is that there's a kind of passive uh, allegiance that we allow ourselves to make too often, where we just say, "Oh, you can tell the story about what uh, that the Havel tells," because it's also beautifully illustrated in this book. Yeah, it's one of the most beautiful. I mean, I think that that essay, "The Power of the Powerless," is one of the yeah. most important political essays of the 20th century. And what what Havel is trying to describe is a situation in which no one believed in the ideology anymore. Okay, cool, you do that. Um, no one believes in the ideology anymore. And yet everyone understands that you have to make some kind of nod in its direction. And then the effect that that, the effect that you have with your small example setting power, you know, so you do it and then other people do it and then it becomes a norm. And suddenly what Havel calls the general panorama is changed so that anyone who is not doing the little submissive gesture stands out. 
right? They stand out in a, in a, in a negative way. And so what Havel is concerned with, I mean, he uses the word unfreedom, like unfreedom is an East European word, which I, which I stole. Um, so uh, um, the un, uh, unfreedom for Havel means you're participating in it. So it's not, you know, you can't really say, says Havel, where the system regime stops and where you start. You know, good and evil, says Havel, is not an external division. The line goes between, in this, right down the soul of each person. And so you have to be aware of all of that and take slightly more responsibility than you think you ought to be taking, right? And, and so Havel has the idea that the, the greengrocer in the story is someone who puts up um, a sign that says workers of the world unite. And the point is that he doesn't believe in that. No it's one completely really- completely hollow slogan. Nobody, yeah, no, right. nobody believes in it. In this nobody opinion. believes it. Nobody believes it, but um, it's the obedience to it that is where you give away your responsibility. And you said the example that everyone else should give away the responsibility. And in so doing, you create this particular kind of, of, of stagnation, right? Where you can't, since you're contributing to a, a truthless environment, it becomes very hard to argue against the present because everyone in some sense is kind of taking part in it. And, by, and because you've corrupted yourself in this small way, right? You then start to scorn people who try to tell the truth about little things, which is where Havel and others in the 70s come to this idea that you have to tell the truth about little things. The little things, like, is the water polluted? Literally, is the water polluted? Like, that's one of the things they were concerned about. Is the water polluted? Um, is the beer of good quality? Like, you tell the truth about little things, and then you build up to the big things. You don't fight a big story that nobody believes in with some other big story. You fight it with the truth that you can actually assemble yourself. With, with, with uh, Manchelous, that, in a sense, after all, is the basis of all uh, civil society, is sharing small truths among people. It's the reason why when we think about uh, the Enlightenment, we think not uh, only or even primarily about Diderot and Voltaire and the great figures. We think about all of the men and women in in um, coffee houses and cafes around Paris. So we're simply in the business of exchanging ideas, flirtation, uh, religious jokes, scatological jokes, and all the things Robert Darnton has written about so so well. And in that way, kind of built up a capital of dissidents that other people could or that the same people could sometimes cash in uh, for um, for political change. Um, well, one, of the, one of the things, if I could just interrupt, like one of the things which is great about Havel is that the truths that he's concerned with are the truths that just matter to you. Like maybe you just really care. Maybe you just have a thing for the 18th century, but maybe somebody else really has a thing about stamps and somebody else really has a thing about, about disco or whatever, right? I mean, Havel, Literally in his in, in, in his most important essay, his example of caring about authenticity is good beer. And when he went to prison, he went to prison because of a rock and roll band, right? Yes. Because of a rock and roll band, precisely a rock and roll band. Not some highfalutin thing, but his idea was, and he wasn't even a rock and roll fan, but his idea was these young people are pursuing something which is authentic for them. And that's the way that life is supposed to be. We're also supposed to have these unpredictable tastes that's what makes us human. And what the system does is that it makes us predictable. Like that's the terrible thing. It makes us predictable. Okay. I just wanted to interject that because that idea of truth for me is so enlivening, but the truth is like what you're willing to take a little bit of a risk for. It's what makes you a little bit different from other people. Yes. It's, and it can be a truth of taste. As you say, I thought Havel was a Frank Zappa fan. Uh, he came around to that. So the band was Plastic People of the Universe, right. okay? And the Plastic People were mainly Lou Reed and Velvet Underground fans, but they took the name from a Zappa song, which yeah, was right. Plastic People, yeah. Right. Which is precisely, by the way, about authenticity and inauthenticity. That's what the song is about. But in a broader sense, it, um, confessing, um, uh, being unafraid to say, I love uh, rock and roll more than I love the music of the Soviet men's chorus, is in <laughs> itself a significant, <laughs> <laughs> a significant moment of of uh, of authenticity. Nora, please jump in here. I'm sure because uh, uh, I, I know you have uh, you must have a view on this as well. Um, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, the story that you were just talking about also illustrates that small acts of courage can create you know societal change. And uh, Timothy talked earlier about the small age in history. And I think that's exactly what I've been trying to do with my work is to focus, to, to look at history, not you know, in, the, in the big picture, but to think of it as um, an individually experienced, a series of individually experienced moments in time. 
because we sometimes tend to forget that uh, history happens in real time and that uh, you know people experience them emotionally and on a very personal level and that's I think what I tried to illustrate I tried to illustrate those personal individual moments just the same way that Timothy talks about what we can do as individuals even in small ways and um, uh, and I think in the end it's all about uh, empathy I think that uh, that's also what images can do and what I saw my role as doing is to create a sense of empathy by showing individuals by making the big term history more personal in a way and adding this personal uh, or emotional dimension um, and yeah I, I think I can see a parallel there to what I think Timothy is doing well if you'll if you'll forgive me adding myself to this Venn diagram it was exactly what I was trying to thematize in my book um, a thousand small sanities which is exactly about um, not thinking about liberalism in terms of a set of abstract contractual ideas, but as a set of immediate examples. John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor conducting their clandestine courtship in front of, interestingly, the rhinoceros cage at the London Zoo is part of the foundation of our, of our understanding of both of search for liberty, the search to end the subjection of women, and the necessity of compromise in, in, in a lifetime between uh, her family responsibilities and their love. And it's exactly the idea of in a thousand small sanities, if I may say, is exactly that that's how we build up um, rational, plausible, deeply liberal societies is through a thousand small sanities more than a single large ideological fixation. Um, uh, I should add right away that um, if you have a question for us, and I'm sure there'll be many questions, please email it to us. We're not doing the, uh, the, uh, the Zoom chat. So please email us your questions. I, I know I am, to talk about ideological fixation. I am fixated though on the present moment. Uh, Tim, you were talking about um, the way in which uh, small acts of truthfulness make, can make um, an enormous difference, that they are the little pebbles that start the big avalanche of, of uh, rational change. But uh, one can't help but feel also the way in which um, submission to a big lie uh, is the same force working in another direction something we've all seen in the last six months. People, um, uh, Republican politicians, who on January 6th were prepared to say, uh, this is wrong, I can't go this far. Violence against the Capitol, uh, an actual act of domestic terrorism, that goes too far. One by one, they are uh, falling down. One by one, they are uh, making their submission. And they're doing it, if I may say, Timothy, very much in the way you describe. That is to say, when you ask, um, a, a once sane Republican politician, was the election rigged? They don't say, yes, the election was rigged, but they say, well, Joe Biden is president, or there were questions about the election, or I'm concerned about election integrity. They find some uh, mouthful of weasel words that will enable them to placate uh, the boss, to placate the, um, the, the deranged gangster who runs their party, and still try and tell themselves, oh, well, I'm not actually committed to the side of violence and insurrection. I just am doing the necessary politic things that enable me to continue my career. Yeah, I mean, one, one, one point about, about, about fascism and the analogies, like we've had this big debate in the US about whether we can actually go to Germany in the 1930s. And I like to think the big lie has settled that debate because when I, I, I introduced that term big lie mm -hmm. into American political discourse um, and yes. it, with respect to this electoral fiction, and I was taking it directly from Mein Kampf. I mean, it's Hitler's public relations advice, as you know exactly. very well, tell a lie which is so big that your followers can't believe you would deceive them on such a scale. And the fact that, I mean, more than half the country seems to think that that actually applies suggests to me that, hey, it's not actually an analogy, like it's a phenomenon. You know, we're dealing with a phenomenon and um, it's a phenomenon which is historically familiar. We know that a big lie, I'm just gonna say that what you said below more abstractly, is something that has a force of its own, right? Like it's not just an absence, it's more like a black hole. Like it sucks, it sucks things in. It sucks in a political party, which now you know filters you as to whether you can say things out loud or not. It sucks in the media, right? So a huge amount of American media is now a big one big safe space for the big lie. And it it it, it polarizes people by by in, in an odd way, because it means since you're believing in something that's not true, you have an automatic opposition of the people who may not, you know, they, it's not that they disagree with you, it's just they kind of want to respect the world the way that it is, and then they suddenly become the enemy. And then it makes 
it makes truth oracular, right? Because it's about what the leader, the tribal leader says is from now on, right? And I was, you know, I was, I was saying at the end of the year that you, it doesn't matter with Trump, no Trump, like this is now going to be the new reality. We're going to be living in this. And unfortunately, that's how it's turned out to be. And the, what some of the, some, the few bits of the text, which I updated have to do with the big lie. And, but that, I mean, if there's any hopeful thing, it's that we have confronted this before, you know, like this is totally, this is actually very familiar, this whole, this whole big lie business and the small truth as a response actually has a certain amount of effectiveness. And it gives you also gives you a way to talk to people because they do maybe care about some of the small true things that you're, that you care about too. And you, it gives you a way to change the subject. It gives you like truth actually gives you small talk. And it, it, if it's a small truth, if it's a big truth, it doesn't. But if it's a small truth, it gives you small talk. It gives you it gives you a way in. Yes, I, I worry though a bit about you know I I wrote a piece uh, not that long ago called Biden's Invisible Ideology for the New Yorker, mm -hmm. where I am a sharecropper, so I'm constantly giving have to, to give them. So it's always for the New Yorker. But the point was is it's clearly the Biden's people and the the people around him believe some version of what you just said, some version of what we all have been articulating, right? The importance of uh, small truths, right? And their theory of the case clearly is, you know, Charlie Goldman, a great boxing manager, once said, you can never win a game another guy thought up because nobody thinks up a game to get beat at it. Meaning that if you go in to slug with a slugger in a ring, you're going to get beaten. And it's clear the Biden people believe that if you get caught up in Trump's game, a game of, of anger and rage and spectacle, and, and you're going to lose because that's a game he invented or at least mm -hmm. um, perfected for himself. And they believe that if you just make advances on every important uh, uh, front, vaccines, the pandemic, the economy, and so on, that that's the strongest path to sanity that we can find. What I worry about, and uh, Nora, I'd love to hear, hear your view on that, this is that one of the weaknesses, as we all talk about, of liberal humanism, liberal democracy, whatever we want to call it, uh, is that we are so attached to institutions and institutionalism that we over, that we simply cannot credit the scale of an assault on those institutions. And until it's too late, we don't believe, even after we've seen it, we don't believe that the institutions are as fragile as they are. And we never respond soon enough to an assault on them because we are so invested in those institutions. Yeah, no, I mean, no. that's, uh, that's what uh, Timothy can talk about more eloquently than I, because one of his uh, uh, chapters is about that. Maybe we can briefly pull up uh, image 10 that refers to that chapter. Uh, well, it's not from that chapter, but it also talks about um, institutions. Yes, I was thinking of that. I was thinking, yes, exactly. Uh, um, sorry, uh, image 10, if possible. Uh, so on the uh, upper top left of the image, um, wh oops, where it says, right. in 2016, American journalists seem to misunderstand That's a presidential right. campaign as a long shot candidate surmounted barrier after barrier and accumulated victory after victory. Our commentary ad blithely as assured us that at the next stage, he would be stopped by one fine American institution or another. Um, which I tried to demonstrate through these rocks that this, um, you know, Super Mario type uh, yes. video game character yeah. is jumping over. And of course he's Trump uh, and he's trying to get to the White House and there's also financial incentive. And um, I, tried, I, I made it look like a game because again, I wanted to highlight this, our willingness to, um, to, be, the, to be the spectators to this yeah, I mean, to the spectacle that we, we didn't take it seriously enough. Um, we were just waiting to see what else could happen. And um, as you just pointed out, we believed that um, institutions would save us in the end. Uh, but what Timothy points out in his book is that we are responsible for those institutions. If they don't have our support, um, they, will, they will fail. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it to him to talk about this more. Just, just add, Nora, one of the things I loved about this illustration is exactly the way that it allows Trump his grotesque qualities, but sees that the grotesque and entertaining qualities are part of the danger. Um, yeah. Tim, but on the, on the question of our over-investment or our illusions of institutions. 
Yeah, I mean, I want to I want to agree with the premise of the question, which we haven't quite gotten down to. Like, I think that we're in a situation now which is as dangerous, probably more dangerous than we were in in 2016, because the attack on the institutions themselves is now planned out and and determined. So little details like things that don't necessarily make the headlines, you know, the latest voter suppression law, um, the latest memory law designed to make white people feel like victims, um, states considering taking over the, the, the prerogative of allocating electoral votes themselves. All of that plus, you know, Republican victories in the House and Senate in 22 set us up for a situation where somebody who loses the election gets installed in, in 20, January of 2025. On the institutions, I would just say two very, bro very broad things. Number one, the institutions don't just need our involvement, they also need our values. So for example, we, we in America have gotten ourselves talked into largely by the Supreme Court We've gotten ourselves talked into this idea that voting is chiefly a matter of the right of states to come up with administrative encumbrances. Mm -hmm. Like the sacredness of voting is the sacredness of some state legislature coming up with some encumbering bureaucracy. And we've kind of gone for that, right? We need to talk about the right to vote, you know, not like disagreeing with this or that little thing, but that there's a right to vote. Like we have to have animated, like liberals, if you want to call us that, like people who are opposing tyranny have to be able to enunciate values because otherwise you leave the normative language on the other side. Like in, in the US, there's uh, the people who have norms often don't use normative language. And the people who don't have norms often do use normative language, yeah. right? And, and that's, so we, there's, there's, there's kind of a trap there. So one thing is the values and the, with the, and the other thing is the future. So use the word ideology, I would use the word future, that what the Biden people need is they need to get out of the trap of having to defend, both defend the status quo and repair it. And what you really need is a future where things are much better because you can't fight, I mean, to put the, like, don't, don't fight by the other guy's rules, don't play his game. You, Trump's game is the past. It's a, the Trump, and you can't, you're not gonna beat him with that. You're not gonna come up with some better nostalgia for white people than you know the nostalgia that we were always innocent and always right and never did anything wrong. That's pretty good. You're not gonna beat that. But you can beat him with the future because he's got zero future. He's got no future. There's no vision of the future. And if you and if you can come up with one that's actually kind of plausible and resonant and interesting, maybe you can beat him, like solidly beat him. And one of the things, one of the ways that the graphics edition of this book is different than the original is that it's much better at portraying the future. Like it's much better at suggesting mm -hmm. the, 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 right. the imagined possibility of a lot of different futures that might be better. Yes, that's fat. That's a, yes, I see that. And that's a, that's a fascinating remark. No, I think it's it, what you say about uh, uh, the people who believe in norms don't talk that language, no, because the norms have been so fully digested or seem to have been into the institutions that talking about process takes the place of talking about principle. I, I, I trivial but but vivid example was I just watching as I was working today Jen Psaki's press conference and all she did was talk about the institutional processes on the fight against inflation broadening energy uh, the even the report on the um, the potential expansion of the Supreme Court and so on and I could see in her and she's an admirable human being uh, her excitement at seeing processes play out. It's one of the ways in which, I'm not ashamed to say, which liberal people participate is through processes. We do it in universities, at magazines, at Parsons, I'm sure that's part of our pleasure. And yet it's a kind of a honey trap very often because one fails to see that what seem to us to be the thrilling processes of democratic governance are in fact seen by uh, countless other people as simply a fog of uh, elitist manipulation and exactly having a, a principled, passionate vision of the future instead of, is the only thing to fight the past. Let me just add quickly that it's very striking in France as well that Eric Zemmour, who is in some respects the French Trump, speaks only of an imaginary past of France, which could have been found only in Vichy, if anywhere. Andrea, I know we have questions. We have questions. Um, we have time for a few questions. This is one, uh, this is a question from somebody who was clearly at a Tim Snyder program at Writer's Block. Uh, at a Writer's Block event with you several years ago, you said that real resistance requires the willingness to be arrested and to be willing to put oneself at physical risk. You said that Americans aren't ready for that yet. After four years of Trump, do you think we're more willing to engage in real resistance? And given all the arrests that happened during the BLM protests, has your answer changed? 
I, I, yeah, I mean, that was, that was several years ago. And I think the, the amount of risk Americans are willing to take has changed. Also the amount of risk that they should take has changed. So like for me, and this was an argument that I was having at the time with other folks, um, I was very, like the way January 6th played out was very uncomfortable for me. I mean, not just that, not just that we had an assault by right-wing terrorists on the Capitol and there could, a lot of people could have been killed, right? Not only that, but that we gave them the streets, right? Like maybe in the end, like I was outvoted, everyone thought I was wrong, but I still don't like that scene. I don't like the scene of we don't have anybody who's like marching for democracy and they have everybody marching against democracy. Cause like, that's one of the uncomfortable truths that, you know, I think some of us don't look hard at. It's just like how many people were there, you know, not just how many people were in the Capitol, but how many people were in DC that day. It was a lot of people. And we, you know, and the, you know, the strategy worked like they didn't kill anybody. Um, the vote went the way it was supposed to go in the, it, like we just barely made it, but there was a lot of luck involved, you know, and I, I play that scene over and over in my mind. And I ask again and again, it's like, we did the right thing in not mobilizing at that moment. But in any event, yeah, I think Americans are more ready to mobilize. Um, the interesting thing about Black Lives Matter, of course, is that most of the protests took place in majority white counties. Um, and most participants, if you just count the numbers, not proportionally, but in absolute terms, were, 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 were white. Um, whether you can take a risk in this country depends a lot on who you are. So it, it BLM protests, like white people sometimes made circles around African-American people for normal, understandable reasons. If you're not a citizen, you're not going to take the same kinds of risks. But yeah, I think the protest potential is much greater. And this, by the way, speaks to Adam's scenario or our, you know, the scenarios of how things go wrong. Because one thing that haunts me is that the Republicans think or the Trump people think they have escalation dominance. They think it's all a game. And if we win the game, if we get the House and the Senate, we install the guy who loses, we win the game. Hooray, we won the game. But it's not a game. It's the world. And, and people aren't going to lay down. Like if they can win the game and they can install a president, the people will not lay down. Right. I mean, it's not I'm, I'm just describing I'm like, you know, this. there are just too many millions of people who aren't going to say, hey, it's OK that some guy lost by 15 million votes and he's the president. Right. And so it's not going to end with the installation of a president who loses. There will be some kind of resistance after that. That's, you know, the scenario will keep going after they win the game. The follow up to that question is um, black, you know, black and people of color. Uh, we're on the front lines of the protests, and they're the ones that got arrested for the most part, um, even though they were in white counties. Um, are, are Black people and people of color most likely to put themselves on the line and their, their lives on the line? I mean, that, that seems like, let me, put, let me answer it a different way. This, all of the things we're talking about mm -hmm. look different for African-Americans how abnormal Trump is and how normal Trump is, I think looks different, whether depending on whether you're white or black. Um, who is on the, what, where, whether you can swing the police to your side or not, I think looks considerably different as to whether you're white or black. Which institutions are to be, you, should, you can trust or you cannot trust, I think looks very, looks very different. Um, what I would say is that there is a much overlooked tradition of black political resistance, which is, often characterized as rioting. Um, my friend and colleague Elizabeth Hinton has two very nice books about this, particularly one of them, um, America on Fire just came, just came out. So, yeah, I mean, I, would, I don't, I, yeah, I don't, so I don't want to like, you know, pass like sort of general racial judgment on, on folks, but it's definitely the case that there is a tradition there, which we sometimes, a, a tradition, let's put it this way, of understanding what's going on, an epistemic tradition that white people sometimes you know, just ignore, like we have, we have our own white ways of being stupid. And sometimes we just overlook that epistemic tradition. So like a lot of folks who did understand what's happening in 2016 were black, right? Um, and, and then there's also the resistance tradition, which we can, which we can, we sometimes think, okay, there was civil rights and then it's over. And then like either everything's fine or it's not, but no, I mean, after civil rights, and this is why the structural racism people have a, have a point after civil rights, uh, nevertheless, a lot of things went wrong, including the way the police behave, including mass incarceration, right, um, including the lack of accumulated wealth and so on. And so there, there's that tradition as well, of like continued resistance. So that's as much as I'm going to say, like, but, but I, I take the general point. Okay, um, here's another one uh, from um, a 
professor at Hunter College. Uh, when did you first begin to viscerally fear that the whole American experiment was beginning to crumble? Was it incremental or might there have been a specific leap towards authoritarianism that really knocked you over? Who was, who was the question directed to? To you, to Professor Snyder. So this is where it really helps to be an East Europeanist because you know, so, so Czesław Miłosz, the great poet Czesław Miłosz, who was in immigration in Berkeley for much of his adult life, like he had this idea that Americans look at things that are, you know, that are, that are on sand and they think they're permanent. Like that this is the, like we don't, we just don't understand how quickly things can change. And studying what I study and living with the people I've lived with, you know, and, and being taught by people who are Holocaust survivors and um, survivors of of, 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 of of communist camps or both in the case of my doctoral supervisor, like that I think helped me see that things can change really quickly, right? So my version of America and exceptionalism is that I love America exceptionally because it's my country. That's where I'm from. And I have no problem with like, I, I have no problem with that kind of patriotism, but I don't have the kind of American exceptionalism which says it can't happen here. You know, I, I don't have, I don't think I have that at all. So there was no moment where I thought, oh, all of a sudden, like my dreams of America have shattered. That never, that never happened. The way that I think about the Republican Party has changed. Um, the way that I think about, the way that I think about race has changed a good deal in the last few years. Like some things have changed, but I never th thought, at least not since I was a child, about America as this kind of perfect democracy and all of a sudden like the curtain has you know been lifted and we realized no. And by the way, like just in general, democracy is not a heritage, it's a project. Like it's always a project. Like the people ruling has to be a project. It can't, it has to be a future oriented vision. If you think we're democratic because we used to be democratic, you've already taken a step away from not being democratic towards not being democratic, I mean. And if I can just throw in one one thought there that may be marginally more optimistic as we approach the end is that even I am not that old. I'm old enough to remember uh, mo significant historic moments when the democratic project, the liberal project, seemed doomed. People now forget that um, Ronald Reagan came to power not preaching American uh, perfectionism, but preaching that uh, American uh, uh, collapse. That the, that the Soviet Union was so strong and trying every door and that was so likely to prevail that the democratic project was doomed. After 9-11 and the hysteria that followed 9-11, we were told again and again that a weak, decadent, pluralist, open society could never compete with a well-regimented and militarized and militant uh, religious re revival. Again and again, to use the example that you too, that Nora and Tim uh, visualized so beautifully the Battle of Britain, uh, when we forget so easily how Churchill stood alone, or Britain stood alone, and everyone was convinced that Churchill would negotiate, make a separate peace with Hitler. And as you point out so cogently, it was only because the Poles decided to resist that they compelled the, the, the Britons to resist. But at that moment, liberal democracy surely seemed as doomed as it ever has. And at each one of those moments, the democratic vision, the liberal vision has proven itself to be resilient, if not heroic looking, and capable of its own renewal. I think that that's a perfect <laughs> spot to end on. And I so appreciate, I so appreciate all of you being here tonight, the audience and Adam and Nora and Timothy, thank you so much. Go to our website and find a link to Skylight Books where you can get this, this terrific edition of On Tyranny and you can get it with signed book plates. So thank you so much and we'll see you soon. Nora, Timothy, thank you for this. Thanks, Nora. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.